Hello and welcome to my review of Jim Butcher's Stormfront, the first book in the Dresden Files. With any luck, nobody will watch this video, otherwise I'm going to get a bit of internet hate. So Stormfront follows Harry Dresden, wizard for hire, an occasional consultant for the police. Harry is called in when the bodies of two lovers are discovered with their hearts exploded out of their chest. Nothing to worry about, I'm sure. Probably just a drunken brawl. In the meantime, he's also odd jobbing, trying to find a missing husband for a private client, and the two cases obviously tie together in the denouement, and what passes between page 1 and 307 of this version is a fairly bright, fairly breezy spiritual investigation in a very slickly crafted world. The world the Butcher creates is a good one, there's a lot going on, there's the mighty White Council that oversees the activities of wizards, human gangsters, vampires, demons, talking skulls that act as computers, a police procedural, fairly convincing if a little half-hearted, a bevy of beautiful women, a couple of mysteries that mostly hold the interest, and Harry the hero of course. All of it executed with a degree of competence, because as the cover says, this is an unusually well-crafted first novel. If you're here for some it's great confirmation bias, I'm going to put a timer on the screen so you can skip the rest of my review and get to some more good bits. Because here we have the first hint of a problem. It certainly feels crafted, but it doesn't feel like the product of a craft. I'm talking about the difference here between this and this. Things are just a little bit too slick and the whole thing reads like it was written in a committee room. You like Buffy? gotta have a vampire. You like Ghostbusters? Gotta have someone get slimed. You like NCIS? Gotta have a hard as nails cops. You like X-Files? Sure you do. This was written in the year 2000. You've gotta have two partners, one who's a skeptic and the other a believer. But most important, you gotta make sure that whatever we do, no matter how many brutal murders and no matter how many aggressively sexual women Harry means, we must not do anything to jeopardize that all-important PG-13 rating. Because this is a world that's rich in quirks, more on them in a bit, rich in spooks, angst, threats, and beautiful women. It even has a rich backstory, no doubt the strong seeds of half a dozen of the book's 14 sequels, because gotta have a franchise, because heaven forbid we might drag up those unfashionable words like saga or series and seem slightly less rapacious. But if somebody is telling you a story and just casually drops into the conversation that they killed their first love, your reaction will be, what? hang on a minute, tell me that story first. You don't just drop spousal murder into a conversation without dwelling on it a bit, unless it's held back for the sequel, of course. And this, despite the effort the Butcher is putting into his narrator's conversational tone, we will return to that in due course as well. But it begs the further question of, if he is not permitted to talk to ordinary people about the White Council, for example, then who is the narratee of this novel? But that's Stormfront. It's assertively superior to most of its peers, and quite a few of the sources it borrows from, but it raises question after question without ever slowing down enough to offer an answer to any of them. It twists dialogue and character to fit scene without ever considering what would be natural or ring true or even make sense in the world it crafts. We learn that Harry has a godmother, a fairy naturally, never explored, not even while Harry is interacting with fairies. Why is he the only practicing wizard? If there are secrets and a whole council to forcefully protect them, why do they let him practice? Why are his spells in quasi-Latin and not just in Latin? Other languages such as Egyptian are used elsewhere, but they aren't quasi-Egyptian. Wouldn't precision and training be more important than faking it? Harry places great stock in his training, facing off with the adversary in the end. He says the only thing that he has on his side is his training, having forgone his weapons in the build-up. But if faking it is okay, why do you even need training? Unless the training is training in how to fake it. This can be applied to the quasi-physics of magic too. Doesn't magic have actual rules in this world? Wouldn't that make the quasi-physics of magic just the actual physics of magic? And, and you don't even bother to tell me which one of the 14 sequels explains all this. I'm sure one of them does. It's just part of the cynicism around Stormfront. The questions are answered in the sequels. Don't forget to buy the sequels, many sequels. Get your sequels here, all the sequels you could possibly want. And all of the questions that I've just asked were things that I thought in the first 30 pages of Stormfront. Like I say, this is a rich book. It's also, but it's also a book rich less in art than in commercialism and contrivance. 
Harry's skills come and go. He can use magic to draw his weapon to him, as easily as saying Ventus Servitus, but he can't when the plot requires him to not have weapons in the next scene. He can fly when he needs to make an entrance, but not to make an escape. His magic hex causes machines to break down around him, including both his and Max's cars, but only after he's reached his destinations, because walking is boring, I guess. When Bob the Talking Skull persuades him to make a love potion for no reason, the inevitable mishap is, well, inevitable. He can be late for his appointment, on time and late again, in the space of nine pages. He finds crucial evidence at a crime scene after the police and forensics have left. It's a film canister under a bed. Haven't we seen that somewhere before? Don't forensics check under beds? Someone comes in looking for it, identifying themselves as the owner of the evidence by immediately looking for it under the bed, which seems a less likely place for a film canister than in a drawer or on a table or almost anywhere else in the building, basically. It's only the first place you'd look for anything if the person writing you doesn't have any faith in the intelligence of his audience. Donny Wise, the owner of the evidence, is appalled by the idea that Dresden might be using Linda Randall for sex, but he has literally traded the film canister for the same thing. Harry then burns the photos to stop Donny blackmailing the people in them, but he needs those photos to properly identify his suspects. He says he has to follow up on Donny's lead, but he basically didn't get one, and then what little he did get, he burned. He then takes a leap of logic that solves the case that really doesn't have very much reliance on anything Donny gives him. On page 212, Harry falls into despair. Have you ever felt despair, absolute hopelessness? Have you ever stood in the darkness and known deep in your heart that it was never ever going to get better, that something had been lost forever and that it wasn't coming back? This melodramatic angst occurs here, not because of a triggering event, the death of Linda Rand would be the most likely place for that, but that doesn't even interfere with his wisecracking, and I'll return to that in a bit. Nor does it follow the scene where Murphy renounces their friendship. It actually occurs here because this is the opening of Act 3, and the Hero's Journey handbook says that's the point of the story where the hero has to be at its lowest ebb and decide to fight back. Normally, when I write my notes for these videos, I give them a one-word title that sums up my feelings about the book, and the word that I picked for this one was Zeppo. Now, Zeppo is an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, probably named after the youngest Marx brother, that gave lead status to the oft-forgotten, maligned, and, if we're honest, largely useless Xander. In effect, this is something of the role Harry plays. Officer Murphy, Rodriguez the reporter, Morgan the White Council's watcher, Bob the Skull, the gangster Marcone, and Linda Randall all run rings around Harry, and most actually seem better equipped to solve the mystery than him. In the Zeppo, Xander gets to sleep with the Slayer Faith after a fight. Because the story is deriving its comedy from mocking his hero, even when indulging in the heroic action, she asks him, are you up for it? And he says, I've never been up with a person before. The language is kind of unnatural, but it's a PG-13 contrived way of getting a little bit of a laugh at his expense. When Monica Sells hires Harry, there is a lengthy discussion between the two, and Harry observes about halfway through that Monica Sells says, I'm a lot. Here's a list of all her dialogue, and I'm not going to read it all because there's a lot. As you can see, she actually says, um four times before Harry's observance that the effort of completing so many sentences without a single um had tired her. You can also see that the lengthy passage without an um that Harry says tires her is no longer than two or three other discourse turns where she doesn't use um either. Harry's observance is a contrivance, a pointless one to make Monica look a little bit stupid and Harry a little bit brighter. Now, there is this offering on page 244, which some might use to suggest that Monica is in fact manipulating Harry into investigating the case. However, that's not supported by the evidence offered. It's also unnecessary, as he is advertising as a wizard for hire, and obviously has few other customers. Monica is not a magic user or a mind reader. Harry's observance, as shown, is completely arbitrary nor does he vocalise it, so Monica would have no way of knowing her trick had worked and therefore no reason to, to drop it. Dropping it would also make it obvious that it was a trick and, an, and Harry would have to be pretty stupid not to have noticed. Instead, Butcher introduces these hesitation markers half-heartedly at first so that Harry can make his observation at Monica's expense and then simply doesn't use them again because she doesn't say um again not once after his observation. 
And if you look at her dialogue, there's some key parts. There's emotional sections, a slip of information she didn't want to divulge. The passing of information her knowledge of would be secondhand and therefore a little shaky. And a key moment here where she has to decide whether to trust Harry or not. All of these utterances are prime candidates for hesitation markers of some description, and they don't get one. Contriving dialogue in this way is Joss Whedon's forte. There are very few that do it as well, and the impact of his shows has led to his overuse in all sorts of pop culture media, which is frankly shiny captain, if you like that sort of thing. But the tone here is occasionally jarring and not really up to the Whedon standard. The gangster Muckern offers Harry advice and Harry says, as long as you don't charge for it. And then he says to his narrator, thank God for wisecracks. But that is not a wisecrack that escapes one of Joss Whedon's writing rooms. It's just not very good. As a narrator, Harry offers us, so I have a problem with creepy dead poisonous things, so sue me. Half a second later and it would have eaten my face off, cheery thought. And one cover note on, for this book actually compared this narrative voice to Philip Marlowe. Just no. Bob the ancient spirit that's trapped in a skull joins in saying things like woo woo who is the babe and there's a um seriously badass toad demon coming down the ladder and then there's this example between Harry and Mac the bartender where they're discussing the reporter Sarah Rodriguez. She's pretty I said smart sexy Mm. Any red-blooded man would have done the same. Hmm, Max snorted. Well, maybe not you. Max smiled a bit, mollified. Still, it's going to make trouble for me. I must be crazy to go for someone like that. I picked up my sandwich and sighed. Dumb, Max said. I just said she's smart, Mac. Not her, you. You simply cannot expect this response here to be a re reaction to this one here. There are two things each reacted to in turn before we even get here. This is kind of ugly, it's so obviously contrived. And the scene ends with, We wizards are subtle, but believe you me, we've got nothing, nothing at all on women. But Susan is literally the opposite of subtle. She is very forward and she is very clear about what she wants and how she wants to get it. The Buffy borrowing continues into the scene where Harry and the police look over Linda Randall's body. Harry and Murphy banter over his hair in a way that's just not funny. And worse, Butcher relates the apparently amusing slogan on his t-shirt despite his utter irrelevance. Let's joke about the unlikeliness of Jesus' resurrection at a murder scene. It's really rather jarring to find these weak attempts at humour in the scene of a brutally murdered woman. One Harry seemed to like, though all the women respond to him in very similar ways, a, a little wish fulfilment perhaps, but Linda is also key to the case. In many regards, this scene actually demonstrates one of Butcher's strengths. I rather liked Linda. She seemed like a good person in need of help and a redemption character arc. I was genuinely sad she met a somewhat predictable end. And this scene had potential to be very affecting. Instead, it's a bit uneven. The scene between Harry and the vampire Bianca is really great. A real investigation of the world and its law. The sparring is strong too and Harry comes out of the scene looking brave-ish and smart, which is perhaps a touch rarer in the text than it ought to be. But no two pages of the book exemplify my confused relationship with Butcher and Dresden better than the demon attack that occurs about halfway through. Harry is naked but armed with his staff. The reporter Rodriguez is with him but she's poisoned and laid out on the ground unable to run from the demon or even move. Her incapacitation prompts Harry to face off with the demon. I looked at the boiling clouds overhead lit by lightning moving among them, deadly beautiful and luminous. Power seethed and danced in the storm. Mystic energies as old as time. Enough power to shatter stone, superheat air, boil water to steam, burn everything it touched to ash. At this point, I think it's safe to say, I was desperate enough to try anything. This bit again is, is uneven. The descriptive section is pretty good, I think. I like the portrayal of the destructive magical storm, deadly beautiful. But I don't think Harry's response to the onrushing demon should be a last desperate act. In the circumstances, it should be... A considered response. Instead, the scene loses its pace as Harry horribly and unnecessarily explains what he's doing, including contriving the incapacitated Susan to regain her control in order to wake up and ask, Harry, what are you doing? She huddled on the ground in her evening dress, shuddering. Her voice was weak, thready. You ever form a line of people holding hands when you were a kid and scuff your feet across the carpeting together and then have the last person in the line touch someone on the ear to zap them? Yeah, she answered, confused. I'm doing that, only bigger. 
The excitement is sapped out of the scene by the unnecessary awkward exposition and two of my more hated Hollywood cliches are indulged, the previously incapacitated person actually being well enough to perform a plot function, in this case a pointless one, and the madly onrushing bad guy taking an absolute age to get anywhere because we need to bend time in order to allow for explanatory dialogue. This novel is presented in first person. It does not require this dialogue-driven exposition in the way that a movie might. Harry just needs to think, I knew what I had to do, tap into the power around me, and the required information is related. The scene isn't stalled. In conclusion, Stormfront is written with a confident assurance that is utterly undeserved. Its lead is a Zeppo, largely serving to be mocked and underestimated by friends and foes, but is nonetheless a mostly effective driving force for a plot that rises above contrived situation and dialogue, above plot points, characters and situations borrowed from elsewhere in the world of pop culture, but assembled here with a little respect and a degree of elan. But on this evidence, Butcher is no Joss Whedon, and his attempts at banter rarely move the needle much either side of competent. But he really can write, and he does a pretty good job of both world building and maintaining a steady stream of thrills, spills and quirks that will keep most people entertained throughout. This is no love-hate relationship. It didn't provoke that strong a reaction in me. It's more like-dislike. My main problem, I think, is that there is a really great book in here trying to get out. Now, I have no doubt that far more people will like it than not, especially if they're a little less choosy and opinionated than I am. As a result, I have no hesitation in recommending Stormfront unreservedly to fans of any kind of supernatural mystery or fantasy media. So I said I'd return to the quirks, and here we are. On page 51, Butcher writes of Sarah Rodriguez. She quirked a smile at me that promised things. This is PG-13, remember? We definitely can't say what those things are. But if the end part is a little weak, the first is pretty good. One of the definitions of quirk is a rapid mouth movement, but it is still an unusual enough use of the word that, as part of building an individual personality for Rodriguez, it is pretty effective, especially as Rodriguez and Randall have such similar ways of feisty flirting as an idiosyncrasy and not quite tick. It's a good way of distinguishing them. However, Butcher overdoes it and applies it to more or less everybody, nullifying that effect as early as just two pages later. It becomes another minor aspect of the book that pulls Stormfront away from being as great as it could have been. Thank you for watching. You know how to use the buttons down there. Ring the bell and you'll get notified whenever I'm whining about a book you love.